Hi, and welcome to the Pandemic Pup, Episode 1, How to Set Your Dog Up for Success Post-COVID. Um, we are talking about getting ahead of separation and anxiety issues before they even start. This is going to be the first episode of a series uh, for the Pandemic Pup, which are going to be live Q&As, all fo focused around your pup and surviving the difference the different things that are happening due to the pandemic in how dogs are being raised um, and different issues that have been coming up. I'm here today with Deb Murray of Pepper's Paws, and we'll be discussing what you can do today to help your dog have an easy adjustment as you return back to work or your kids return back to in-class learning. Um, from, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name's Kelly. I am the founder of Mainline Pets page and the Mainline Pet Community Group. I'm also a CPDTKA certified dog trainer um, and owner of Stay Dog. Um, this, the group that we created in Mainline Pets is all based about doing what we can to prevent dogs from being given up for adoption. That's where this series has come from and why we are putting it together. It's really just to help all the dog owners out there. And if you're not aware what separation anxiety is, it's more or less your dog having a panic attack um, when they're separated from you. And it can lead to many unwanted behavioral issues um, in a dog. While your dog may be in heaven right now, um, being home with you all day long, as restrictions get lifted and we begin to spend more time away from our homes, this may lead to them developing separation anxiety. Um, and again, it can lead to unwanted behaviors. Unwanted behaviors, poor behaviors, are the number one reasons why dogs get given up for adoption. And again, that's why we want to start doing what we can now to prevent those issues from coming up um, during this pandemic. Um, we're going to talk today about what we can do to prevent it. But throughout this series that we are doing Monday nights, 730, we're going to be talking with a variety of different pet professionals um, and different things regarding this. We're going to have holistic approaches such as CBD, animal Reiki. We'll be having talks on puppies specifically with the pandemic, enrichment, um, so we and different products that you can use for this. So we'll be covering a broad array of different topics during this. I'm going to go ahead and apologize as we are having some technical difficulties. Um, while Deb can hear me and you can hear both Deb and I, I cannot hear Deb. So we're going to do some improvising. Um, so bear with us, but we have a lot of great information to share with you on what you can do with your dogs. And we'll be taking a lot of Q&A from our audiences. Um, please like this video if you find it useful. Share it with someone or tag it with someone who can use this information as um, it's going to be important for particularly any new pet owner to know. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Deb. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Deb is a certified professional behavioral consultant. Um, she's the owner of Pepper's Paws. Uh, she is a also a, a certified trainer. She is a certified fear-free animal trainer. And her credentials go on and on and on, so I'm going to kind of leave it at that. <laughs> um, we talked a little bit earlier, but uh, we, Deb, I'm going to kind of let you go in, and I'm going to kind of get the cue from my sister over here when you're done. <laughs> um, okay. But uh, we, we just wanted to talk about what, we're, what we are expecting with the p pandemic and how dogs are going to react. Okay. So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, pl pleasure to be here. Um, one of the frequent calls that I'm getting now with pandemic puppies and, and puppies and their juvenile dogs is they, they really, they're struggling with behavior problems. One of the most common ones is they don't like being left alone. 
So they're put in a crate and they bark or they cry or they try to dig out or try to break out. Um, that's when you're home, when you leave the house, they can't cope with being alone. They, they have a panic attack. They, they poop and pee in their crate. They, they really kind of fall apart when their owners are gone. Um, and the most dangerous part of everything that I'm seeing, and by dangerous, I mean it's going to have some significant consequences down the road, is the owners don't realize either they have a problem or how bad the problem is. And when that day comes, when life goes back to normal and we can all leave our houses and, and we're busy and, you know, full calendars and doing things, we're going to have a lot of dogs that are not going to be able to cope with being left alone. And when you look at why dogs are uh, returned to rescues and shelters and breeders, most times it comes down to behavior problems. And this particular behavior problem is one of the most challenging to resolve and heartbreaking to resolve in my experience because you have to be home to resolve it. And if you're not home, you can't work on it. So the problem doesn't get better. Um, so we were talking um, amongst my trainer friends and then, um, and then Kelly reached out to me to say, how can we help people prepare for what we really hope is the inevitable? And that is that someday life goes back to normal and we leave the house and our dogs have to be independent and be able to stay on their own. Um, I want to do a quick check to make sure everybody can still hear me. I see Kelly has disappeared. I'm to make sure everybody can still hear me. Can somebody just say, yes, you can hear me? Okay. I'm going to hope that's a yes, and we're going to keep going. Oh, Kelly's back. Still can't hear you. Okay. All right. So a couple, let's see, Kelly, one of the things we had talked about was how do you know if your dog has separation anxiety, right? So let's talk about what separation anxiety is not. If your dog, um, you leave, you leave the house, your dog is out you know, loose in the kitchen and you come home and your dog's knocked over the trash can and maybe had an accident because you left him for four hours. That's not necessarily separation anxiety or a separation related behavior. That could just be you were gone a while, the trash can was fun, and your dog got into it. Okay. When we talk about separation anxiety or, or distress at being left alone, we're talking about things like your dog will hurt himself or herself to get out of the crate. Um, your dog will do whatever it takes to get out of the crate. You come home and your crate looks like it's been through a war zone. Um, a dog who is in a puddle of drool and is trembling. Um, I've worked with dogs who have broken out of crates and ate through drywall and destroyed garage doors to follow the owner when they leave. That's the kind of stuff that we really hope everybody who's joined us tonight really can work to avoid because that's really a worst case scenario. Um, I see Kelly and I are trying to talk at the same time. So I'm going to keep going and initial figure it out. So we're talking about severe distress of being left alone, um, bodily injury, extreme um, destruction, that sort of a thing. So we have some uh, questions uh, okay. that uh, we're going to go over um, so that we can help some people. Um, one of those questions uh, that was posted in our group, pre-COVID, my two-year-old dog loved playing with other dogs in the dog park. Since we had so many months of solo ball play she is very possessive of her toy now and gets growly when other dogs want to play with her what can i do i'm afraid to take her back to the park okay so first of all it can be easy to blame any behavior change on covid not everything is going to be because of covid okay so uh, the dog was a year and a half everything was fine at the dog park the dog is now six months older the dog could be deciding, I am an adolescent dog now, and I don't want to share. And this is my ball, and you're not taking it. And it might not have anything to do with solo play or COVID at all. It could just be the dog is maturing, and maybe the other dogs in the park are younger, and the dog's just said not happening. What I suggest you do is really, really think about why do you want to take your dog to the dog park in the first place? If it's to socialize with other dogs, leave the toys at home. Socialize with the other dogs. Toys in a dog park can be a, a really bad idea. Um, there can be fights. There can be, um, and the, the dog fights can lead to people get involved, and that's just a really not a good thing to do. If the goal is to take the dog to a dog park so that your dog can play ball with you, then I would go to the dog park at a time when it's unlikely to be really crowded with other dogs. 
And if dogs start to show up, pick up the ball and then leave if necessary. But you really want to look at what's the purpose of what you're doing and decide, is that the right environment and or the right time of day to do it? Do we have another question? Are you good? Okay, so yes. <laughs> uh, just give me some hand signals if you don't mind. You got it. Um, one of the things we were talking about, Deb, is um, are dogs predisposed to having separation anxiety? Are there okay. signs that a dog is more likely to have separation anxiety than any another dog that you see? I know that in the field, I see that a lot. We were kind of talking about it, but love to get your input. Okay. Okay. So dogs that get rehomed several times can be more predisposed to having separation uh, distress because they're not, they're, the world is not stable and it's unpredictable and they haven't had a safe place. Um, dogs who tend to be Velcro dogs, so they follow the owner around. They're always at your side. You literally can't go to the bathroom without them joining you. That could be a warning sign that your dog could have a separation problem that either you haven't noticed or hasn't come up because you haven't left it for long enough yet. Um, but in both of those cases, that, that's what I look for is, does the dog show, it's called Velcro dog. I'm always at your side. And if that's the case, you want to work on building some independence in your dog and some separation from you so he's not always by your side. And if your dog is new to you and has been rehomed a couple of times, do your, your level best to have the dog develop a routine um, expectation for mealtime, walk time, time with you so that they get a feeling of predictability and familiarity so that when you do need to leave them, it's not yet another disruption in their life that's already all over the place. Okay. Next question. So another question is, um, what can owners be doing right now to help prevent their dog developing separation anxiety when they leave? Okay. So for all of you who have what we're, what we're calling in the, the dog trainer world, pandemic puppies, puppies that were brought home between March and say August, September timeframe, when you're home all the time, and isn't it wonderful to be home all the time, give those dogs time in the crate when you're home and also leave them in the crate and go out. Start from as close to say a week or two in as you can giving that dog some independence and building that skill of being alone. Um, I was trying to thought. Additionally, um, for dogs that are juveniles or older dogs, I like to do a test and really see how will they do when I can leave them alone, but I don't have to go somewhere. So I'm going to put them in a crate. I'm going to put a camera up. Um, it could be something as low tech as, you know, a phone on your dog and you watch it when you leave. It could be something as high tech as a security camera, but you want to have eyes on your dog and watch what your dog does. You can leave your dog with a stuffed Kong or, a, or an edible chew toy that you know is safe and watch your dog's reaction. It's not uncommon for a dog to bark a little bit when you first leave. It could be like a test, like a wolf, like, are you still there? Wolf. Then they normally will settle back down. If you see that after 10, maybe even 15 minutes, your dog is just not looking happy, not settling, and is a bit distressed, then you have work to do. If you leave and your dog immediately has a crazy barking meltdown or tries to break out, or you see them trying to hurt themselves, come back in, like, take a pause, let the dog realize you're home, calm down, let the dog out. And that's a point when you want to start working on this separation behavior. Don't let it, don't, it will not resolve on its own. You're going to need to work on it. Okay, next question. Okay. All right. So um, <laughs> we definitely have some questions coming in, which we'll get to, of course. But um, are there th things that owners are doing now that you think could be making separation anxiety worse? Okay. You know, we talked a little bit before yes. about when you walk into someone's house and they comment that the dog never leaves their side. Um what are you seeing out there where it's kind of a something you know that is that dog is most likely going to develop separation anxiety? Yes. So the probably the most common thing that I'm starting to see is that people stop crating their dogs. They either give up on puppies because the puppy's adorable, they want the snuggle time, 
or their young dog barks in the crate. So they figure, oh, I'm always home. I don't need to crate him. You do. A crate is a safety device. A crate is a way to give your dog a safe space to be, to feel secure. Um, definitely don't abandon the crate. This, the second most common thing I see is that people make a big fuss over their dog before they leave. And it's like, oh, I'll be back. Everything's fine. Don't worry. I'll be back. And then when they come home, it's, oh, hey, did you miss me? Everything's fine. You're okay. Come on, come on. And they really, really add a lot of energy and excitement to their departure and to their return. What I, what I advise my clients to do is if you leaving your dog home in the crate by themselves is no big deal, then act like it's no big deal. No big goodbyes, no big hellos. They're the, they're the two, two biggest mistakes I see. So keep with the crate and keep things low key when you come and go with your dog. Okay. <laughs> um, so speaking of the crate, and I, again, I'm kind of listening a little behind. Um, someone wrote in and said, trying to train my three and a half month old crested to be left alone in the crate. I usually take him everywhere. And someone's always with him, but I need to teach him to be alone for the short amount of time. Any help is appreciated. I've been trying to put him in the crate for naps and be in the house quiet, but he still freaks out. Do you have any additional advice for mm -hmm. this person? Yeah. So if your dog, let's look at what, what upsets the dog. Is it the fact that he's in the crate okay, and he's not near you at all? Is it the fact that he's in the crate and you leave the room? Is it the fact that, you know, if, if you if you leave the room for 10 minutes and after 10 minutes he gets upset, figure out where you're starting from. And then from there, you want to do baby steps. And by baby steps, I mean a couple of a couple of minutes, either in the crate with you next to the crate, if that's where you're starting from, or in the crate with you across the room, if that's where you're starting from, or in the crate, and then you leave the room. And what you do is you put him in the crate Pick out where you're going to be, right next to him, across the room, or totally left the room, and go for a couple seconds and come back. Go for a couple seconds away and come back. Build up that time in baby steps so the dog builds up some confidence in knowing I go in the crate, she leaves, or he leaves, they always come back, and they build up an expectation of there's nothing bad is going to happen. But that's where you want to start, and, if you, if you, and at all costs, if you can, don't crate the dog and leave the dog alone for three hours if the dog can't stand you not being there for two minutes. You can you can cause more harm than good and have a major setback in trying to make any kind of progress with this if you suddenly violate your dog's trust of if I'm at the point where I, you leave and I come back after a couple seconds. You got you got to work at the dog's pace. You don't get to set the schedule on this. The dog does. Okay. So if the dog going back, these were two questions that we had. If the dog, so first, the first one was, what can we do for our Velcro dog? Okay. So for a Velcro dog, you want to work on separation. And even if that separation where, Janessa, you're working at your table in your dining room and there's a gate up and your dog is on the other side of the gate, maybe having a frozen Kong or a food puzzle where she just can't be right by your side. Um, that's where you want to start with that. You want to put in some sort of physical separation. If you can't do a gate, can you tether the dog, meaning put a leash on the dog, put the leash under the end of the couch, give the dog a food puzzle to enjoy while you're across the room. Because for a Velcro dog, the idea is have your dog learn to build some space from you. Okay. The other thing you want to do is not reward that attention seeking behavior. So if you're trying to work and your dog comes over and is bugging on you, we're trying to get your attention, just keep working. Ignore your dog and see what your dog does. If your dog comes over and says, you know, has his head on your lap or pawing at you and you go, no, it's fine. It's fine. You're, you're good. You're good. It's okay. You've just told the dog, if you want my attention, come over and put your head on my lap and bug me while I'm working. And they'll maintain that Velcro, that Velcro behavior with you, which is definitely a warning sign with separation anxiety. Okay. Kelly. Okay. So all good. Um, if the dog is not crate trained, what can we do to give the dog time alone? Um, if the dog has separation anxiety, true separation anxiety, well, it will do whatever it needs to follow you and you don't leave it in a crate. You need to work on it immediately because like I said, I have worked with dogs who have eaten through drywall and broken teeth to follow the owner. Okay. 
if you don't crate your dog and you don't have separation anxiety per se, but you're concerned you will, then use a baby gate or use a tether, which is just a leash underneath a heavy piece of furniture or just something solid and stable. Okay, you don't have to crate, but having a dog being, being able to be crated is a really smart move. And I would encourage everybody to be able to crate your dog because it gives you a place to keep the dog safe. If you ever travel, you can take the crate, the dog can be safe in a hotel room and your dog is not going to redecorate while you're out because you might not like the decorations. Okay. All right. Um, this, I think we also talked about at length, Deb. Um, my one-year-old dog used to go in his crate on command. Now he knows the routine and won't listen on command to go to his spot. High quality treats don't motivate because he knows I'm leaving. He does settle and lay and sleep. How do I get him to listen again? Put the leash on him. Put the leash on and say, come on, crate up. And then walk him over to the crate, guide him into the crate, take the leash off, close the door and drop a treat in from the top. A leash is one of the simplest ways to get your dog to do what you need them to do. And you don't have to be you know, tugging on it and jerking the dog around. For a lot of dogs, you put that leash on and they go, oh, okay, I guess you're in charge, not me. All right, I'll follow you. So I would, I would use a leash for a dog like, like that. Okay. Next question. All right. <laughs> um, my almost three-year-old dog refuses to go for walks anymore. He also won't go outside at night. He is definitely afraid of fireworks and other loud noises. How do I get him past this? Not sure if that's exactly separation anxiety or not, but what we can discuss. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the tricky part with that is I need to know a little bit more about when did the behavior start? Um, was it a specific incident? Is it fireworks or and, and has it always been something and now it's a problem because it's pandemic time and you want to go for a walk at night? I need to know a little bit more about that to tell you for sure. The one thing I would say is, you know, and I am not a vet and I'm not going to diagnose or treat anything in this this live tonight. But if you have an, an anxiety for noise, or your dog has a noise phobia, or noise anxiety, talk to your vet. Your vet might be able to recommend um, a medication that could help with this, especially if it's something that's more predictable, like I'm afraid of the dark or I'm afraid of um, thunderstorms. So that, that's where, and, and given that your dog is three years old, it's unlikely that this suddenly started. It could be have been building for years and now you're just noticing it more because you're home more, I'm not sure. But that's probably where I would start with that. You. All right. So what if they don't stop bugging you when you're working, even if you ignore them? Okay. I think we kind of covered this one. That's where I want to use a crate or a gate or physical separation so they can't get to you. Um, that's, that's what I would do with that. And if you find that your dog just has tons of energy and they're bugging you because they want to go for a walk or they have energy to get, to get out, I would either plan time of my day for a leash walk or two, or I'd find a high quality daycare and send them to daycare for the day. And then the next day when you're working from home, they should be more tired and you might have to get into a routine like that where it's day daycare one day, home the next day and alternate. Um, the age of the dog really is probably the biggest factor in that. Younger dogs, like say old puppies and older puppies and juvenile dogs really could be you know, full of energy and need more to do that while you're home working online all day, they, they really need a job. And sorry if um, I'm repeating some questions or things that you already discussed because uh, <laughs> I'm trying to lip read and listen uh, 30 <laughs> seconds behind and it doesn't, I don't do well with that. No anyway, uh, another question is, we rescued two adult dogs last year. One, we had a hard time potty training and both have, have the tendencies to break out. We were just making progress with the longer stints in the crates i'd go home at lunch to let them out we've been leaving them for a brief for brief stints any advice on preventing issues when they're going to be left longer we've also tethered two crates open together so they share that space they seem to be doing better that way is there any concerns with doing that hmm. so that really depends on the dogs, whether that's a bad thing to do or not in terms of having two dogs in a confined space. Um, 
if they get along and they've never had a problem and you don't leave them with toys or food and it's been working, you could be okay. Um, I'll be honest, that makes me a little bit nervous because if there's, say, something exciting going on outside the window, uh, you have a delivery or a truck backfires or something, and one of them gets overexcited, you could have some some uh, redirected uh, aggression or redirected excitement on the other dogs, and then they're, you know, having a tussle in a very small space. So uh, I don't know what kind of dogs you're talking about. If you're talking about like two, you know, 80 pound German Shepherds, that's a little dicey, I think. If they're smaller dogs, it might be okay. Um, that's one where I would definitely reach out to a trainer um, and have a more more detailed conversation if you're really concerned. Um, I need some more information to answer that completely. Um, in terms of breaking out of the crates, though, I would just make sure that when you leave, the the pan is in and tucked in with the, the, the little lip thing that holds the pan in. Make sure um, the door is secure. I'm not sure how they're breaking out, but you want to make sure it's secure, especially because if you if your crate has two locks or two sliding mechanisms, and you just do one, especially if you just do the top, then you risk the dog getting caught coming out the bottom and that could be disastrous. So um, a little more information uh, on that would be helpful to dig into that for you, but that, that would be my initial thought on that. Okay. Okay, so speaking of all of that, uh, one of the things we talked about was when should someone declare, hey, the books, the YouTube videos, all of that is just not enough. You need to get some professional help. Okay. So, and, and Kelly, since we talked earlier, I've been thinking about this more and more. So I'm going to add a little bit to what we talked about earlier today. So first of all, if your dog is injuring themselves, breaking teeth, you find blood on the crate, um, trying to get out. If you find drywall holes where your dog has gone through a wall, or you find that there's blinds ripped down and the dog's trying to go out a window, absolutely you in that case you want to call your vet and you also want to call a trainer okay um if you are finding that you come home and your dog is a pool of drool and is trembling and really can't function or, or the neighbors call you and say hey the dog barked all day every day you definitely want to get with a trainer um anything that's let go is is not a good idea because this this behavior generally does not resolve on its own um, the other thing to keep in mind, and this is where when I, when I look back over the 10 years or so I've been doing this, the separation anxiety cases that resolve the best are the ones who were had the owner home the majority of the time, if not all the time, so they can work on it. They can do the short duration leaving and coming back. Um, they can desensitize the, dog, desensitize the dog to things like picking up my keys doesn't mean I'm leaving. Because right? some dogs, they get really wise to what are the signs you're going to leave. And if you pick up your car keys, you pick up your purse, you pick up your briefcase, your dog goes, I know what's coming next. And the panic starts right away. Okay. Um, make sure you have enough time to work on it. And at that point, I would absolutely contact the trainer. And, you know, there's when you work with a trainer on separation and separation anxiety, like when I work with my clients, we make sure the dog is getting enough physical exercise, enough mental stimulation, and that's training or food puzzles. Um, you know, really, really good brain time. I also make sure the dog has been desensitized to being in the crate at all. I usually start with teaching a dog to go in the crate on command because I, I want to take away every stressor I can from the ultimate stressor of you're going to be left alone. So you're getting physical exercise, you're getting mental exercise, you're going in the crate on your own, you're getting your meals maybe in the crate. And then we work on this short time away. When I work with a client, we might do four or five lessons over four or five months. So it's not going to be every week. It's going to be spaced out more so you have time to work through this kind of stuff. If you find though that your dog is really injuring him, 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 himself or herself, or you're finding it's just not getting better, I would also reach out to your vet. And when you do, have an open mind because your vet might recommend medications that could help your dog learn to relax and trust enough so that he or she can be left alone. And then you can work on all these behaviors. Um, but anytime injuring, breaking out of the crate, um, trying to get out of the house, it, crying for hours and hours, definitely, definitely reach out for help. A trainer, a vet, even a vet behaviorist, um, if it's really severe, can all be really good options. 
Any advice on leash training? The dog does great while off leash, but has a very hard time on on leash. Um, and he's impossible to work with. I need a lot more information for that. Is it as he barks, he pulls, he I'm not sure quite what, what I can add to that one. I need some more information for that. Sorry about that. Yeah, back to you. Okay. Um, <laughs> my dog destroys her bed occasionally. Uh, do you have recommendation on bedding that is good for sometimes destroyers? Usually fine in the crate, aside from storms and the lawnmower outside. Okay. So one of the things that I've seen hundreds of times at this point is a puppy somewhere between the ages of six months and a year absolutely destroys their bed for no apparent reason. You come home and the dog has just had a de-stuffing bonanza. What I would do, first of all, for a small puppy, they'll probably love any kind of bed and they're, they're unlikely to really destroy it when they're born. as they get older you can decide at some point let's say your dog destroys a bed don't put any bedding in for a while give it a couple weeks and by the way that's not cruel or mean a lot of dogs will love to lay on the plastic it's cold it feels good then maybe try a beach towel and see how they do in the beach towel for at least a couple weeks and then their their destruction period might be over at that point and then you can try an actual crate mat or a crate bed. If you have an older dog who sometimes just gets a little bored and does a little bit of nibbles, um, Kong makes a really nice crate mat. Um, they're usually black. They're usually pretty heavy duty, almost feel like a, almost like a canvas on top. They tend to hold up pretty well. And I'm sure Kong and probably Cargo probably makes one, probably a bunch of other um, big companies. But go for something without that fake wool or stuffing. It's something that's more solid and, and really well made and put together. Um, but expect, I hate to say this, but expect pretty much every puppy at some point is going to just have a lot of fun with that bed one day and there's going to be no warning and they'll probably rip it up and then that might be the only thing they ever do. But you, know, you can always leave with something that's less expensive to replace and also doesn't have materials they could ingest and hurt themselves. Okay. All right. Um, this is a good question. We hear this a lot, but when do you know you should see a behavioralist versus a trainer and what's the difference? So that's an interesting one. So, and this is, it's, there's different camps on this one. So if you notice when Kelly read my credentials earlier, oh my I don't describe myself as a behavioralist or a behaviorist or anything like that. I am a certified dog behavior consultant with the certification bodies that I've gotten certified through. Part of what they're, they hold a high standard to is actually credentialed individuals and what your credentials mean. And a behaviorist is somebody who, who holds an actual certification in animal, animal behavior, usually a PhD, or they're a veterinary behaviorist, which is a veterinarian who's done additional training where they, they also hold that additional, um, it's a di diplomatic thing they call it, a diploma in animal behavior. And so that's kind of like the, the, big in, the big answer on that one. In terms of what you're working with, you want to look at what the problem is. So if you need medication of any kind, that's not a trainer or a behavioralist. That's a veterinarian or a veterinary behaviorist. Okay. They're the only ones who can legally um, uh, prescribe medication, make diagnoses, and, and, and anything like that. So that's, that's the kind of the top of the food chain in the behavior world. If you're, if you're dealing with separation anxiety, you don't necessarily need a behaviorist, but you need an experienced trainer who has worked through separation anxiety cases and who knows the best way to resolve them. So this is not a trainer that say is right out of dog trainer school or right out of the, the volunteer program of the SPCA. You wanna work with somebody who understands animal behavior and can talk to you in terms of behavior that doesn't involve things like you know, necessarily like dominance or alpha and that kind of stuff. Like you want someone who understands the science behind why dogs do what they do. Um, I would look for a certified trainer. There's a lot of different certifications out there. It doesn't guarantee that you've got someone with the right level of experience and knowledge for you, but it is a start. Um, the certifications require a lot of hours of experience and standardized tests and proctored environments and all that kind of stuff. So. It's, it's probably a, a good thing that I would look for when you're looking for a more, a more experienced trainer. Okay. All right. 
Any tips for dogs who have anxiety while riding in the car? How can I help relieve the stress from my dog that only exhibits while ang- with when he has anxiety and while in the car? Okay. So we were talking about the baby steps that you take to resolve separation anxiety, which is you figure out where you're starting and you gradually build and make progress from there, build in in case separation anxiety time alone. With a car, it's work up to making a positive association with the car, right? So it can be, I get in the car and I get treats, or I get in the car and I get my favorite toy, or I get in the car and I get to get out of the car right away. Nothing bad happens. Gradually build up time in the car while it's stationary and off, okay? From there, short rides in the car that end in fun is my best recommendation. So get in the car, drive down the driveway, get out and go for a walk. And come back, get in the car, drive up the driveway, the, f- the first car ride took you to the walk. The second car ride took your dog home, which is a wonderful place. And you gradually want to extend the length of time in the car. You're going to want to play with a couple things. So I don't know if the dog that was asking has, gets car sick or is just anxious or both. Keep the rides really short in the beginning. Gradually make them longer as they go. If the dog gets car sick, you're going to want to play with a couple different things. You're going to want to try having the dog where they can't see out of the window So they're either in a crate on the floor or on a leash on the floor um, or in the the back of a car where they can't see the world flying by them. Um, You can also try having the dog tethered in the seat with the window open for some dogs. As long as that window's open a crack, they're okay with it. Um, But the name of the game is really going to be figure out where your dog is starting from and gradually increase the amount of time and the distance in the car, but always try to have it fun. Do not always have it end at the vet that can be a source of the dog's anxiety right there. So short rides that end in fun. So there is a question that says, what about separation anxiety from one specific human? I'm going to ask for some more details on that because I feel like we need a little bit more information to give any answer on that. So if you could post some more details on that, that'd be helpful. Um, In the meantime, we also have, um, we had a dog or a baby... Sorry, we had a dog. We had a baby over COVID and our dog is having trouble adjusting to the new baby. What can we do? Okay. So we need a little more information for this one too. So I need to know what trouble adjusting means. Is it he's he wants more attention? Is it his schedule has been changed so he's not getting enough exercise? So he's, um, you know, because he's stealing things around the house, is he getting into the trash? Um, is he growling at the baby? Is he hiding from the baby? Um, that one's kind of a loaded question, so I definitely need more information on that. Um, if the person asking it wants to have a more detailed conversation, I do actually have a dog and baby program that we can work through to help the dog be safe and, and happy around the baby. But I definitely need more information to give a detailed answer from what was given. Okay. So, um, Someone asked, for a single dog owner, would a second dog help with separation anxiety? Uh, I already have my answer for that, but uh, <laughs> I'll let you go. So for if you have one dog with separation anxiety and you always wanted a second dog and you've tried everything you can to help the first dog with separation anxiety and you feel like you're at the end of your rope and you've always wanted that second dog, Become a foster (laughs) and start by fostering dogs. A lot of local rescues need fosters right now. Become a foster. The second dog can help a separation anxiety dog sometimes. I've also seen it go the other way where you now have (laughs) two dogs with separation anxiety instead of one. And take it from someone who has four dogs. Every time you add a dog, you do not add a playmate to occupy the first dog. You add responsibility and work and expenses, and it can it can get to be a lot pretty quickly. So the short answer is sometimes yes, but first make sure you want that second dog independent of the first, and you've exhausted the other measures before you get them. And even then, don't make the commitment to a second dog right away. I would become a foster for a rescue first. Remember, again, the current theme tonight is baby steps. Kind of goes back to our uh, conversation earlier that there's not a lot of difference between the kids and the dogs, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like adding those extra kids. Yes. Um, 
My dog tends to pee a little whenever someone new comes around. Is this a behavioral issue that can get fixed? So if the dog is younger than a year old, there's a very good likelihood that it will resolve on its own just as the dog gets more developed muscles and stronger and grows up a little bit. What I would recommend you do if it's a younger dog, first of all, let me, let me back up. If the dog is having urine leaking of any kind, give your vet a call. Run it by your vet and make sure there's nothing they want to look at. I have worked with dogs, especially females, who after they were spayed, they had problems with incontinence. So let's make sure it's not an incontinence problem and a medical problem to begin with. Okay. Young dogs generally grow out of the behavior. Um, my recommendation is when new people come over or, or even family members, the dog is going to get excited by have the people text you or call you when they get there and take your dog out in your, in your front lawn or in, if you're in an apartment in, in a grassy area, not in your house. So when the dog pees a little bit, it's not a big deal. Okay. Um, if the dog pees and cowers or looks sheepish or submissive, call a trainer, start working on confidence building exercises right away. You want that dog to know you do not have to be afraid to meet people. Let's build up some confidence with that. If your dog is an older dog and still doing this, absolutely run that by your vet. There, there could be something going on and you will never fix a medical problem with behavior change programs. Okay, so kind of going back to our one question earlier, we were asking a little bit more information about what about separation anxiety from one specific human? It sounds like this dog only stresses, notices when the poster leaves the house, but doesn't care at all when the husband does. Um, what can she do for that? Okay, so if it's, if the, let's say the dog is attached to, to the wife, not the husband, um, if the wife is the primary caregiver for the dog, if the wife is home all the time with the dog, if the wife is the one who's the giver of food and playtime and walks, what the wife needs to do is as much as feasible, step back from that caregiver role and let the husband become the person who does all the awesomeness. So the husband becomes the feeder, the husband becomes the play, the player, the walker, and really try to build up the bond with the husband while decreasing the bond um, or to, to the, the wife. And the same way with separation anxiety, you start with baby steps. So a little bit of time away from a dog who can't be left in a crate. Same thing, if the dog can't be away from mom very long, dogs on a leash, hanging out with dad, maybe having some treats or some playtime, mom should leave and then come back and do that several times and build up the time away from the dog. So while he's building up the bond with the husband. And I'm, this is better okay. than making an assumption okay. that there's no aggression involved. That this is just, I'd rather be with mom, not I'm afraid of dad and I'm going to growl at him. Okay. <laughs> All right. As far as breaking out of the crates, they would pull out at the walls until they get the crate to collapse. We had a clips to secure. But they still pulled and bend the wire of the crates. I worry about them breaking teeth. Yes. Um... I would probably switch to a plastic airline crate because there's there the sides are hard <laughs> plastic, the top is hard plastic. It's much harder to break out of, but I would always absolutely have a camera on the dogs and see if the airline crate actually takes away the fun of breaking down the walls or do they just go out escaping from that crate even harder? And then in that case, um, I would definitely contact the trainer because you want to come up with a way to leave them safely. And it sounds like leaving them out of the crates, would not they're not ready for that. So I would definitely give a trainer a call in that instance. Okay. Our new puppy, a four-month-old lab mix, will only walk easily on the leash when the kids are walking with us. If just my husband or I are trying to walk her, she doesn't want to leave the kids. Any suggestions? So... It sounds like the puppy either feels safer with the kids or if the kids are just more fun. So what I would start to do again is have start the walk with everybody and then at some point have one of the adults and the kids peel away from the other adult and let the puppy keep walking. And if you see how he does with that, you could also have um, them peel away and stop and see if the puppy will walk to them just, just while he's walking solo with the other adult. Um, 
I'd also be concerned that one I would recommend that you talk to a trainer because I'm a little concerned that there's some underlying anxiety or fearfulness there. One of the things I encourage my clients to do with all their puppies is come up with a list of things that your dog is afraid of, that your dog is unsure about, and work with a trainer to work through those items. One of the most common things I see is a puppy is insecure, maybe they're submissive, they'll, they'll pee a little bit, they're afraid on walks, and around a year, year and a half old, the puppy has tried all these different ways to show you they're afraid, and then they try some forward aggression, and it's a growl or a lunge or a sniff. And basically what the dog is effectively saying is, for the first year, year and a half of my life, I was whispering and saying, I'm afraid I need space, now I'm gonna shout. And, and that's something I see like clockwork, and usually it starts around a year, and I get the call around a year and a half. So work with a trainer to build that puppy's confidence. Okay. Is it a concern when your dog shows extreme jealousy towards any other dog? My dog will literally stand in front of me if I try and go near any other dog. So, yes, that is definitely concerning if there are other dogs in your life with your dog. That behavior, that blocking in front is a form of resource guarding and your dog doesn't want to share you. And that is something I would work with a trainer on. Um, your dog probably guards more than just you. And we want to really understand what those items are and work your dog through that so they, they stop the guarding behavior, learn how to share you and learn more positive behaviors. Depending on the dog's age, that could also get worse too. If the dog is like a juvenile dog, so say seven, eight, nine months old, when they hit that year, year and a half, the, the world could shift a bit and it could definitely get worse. So that, that's a good one to work with the trainer on. All right. Our COVID puppy is just about one. We got him in May. When kids are playing on the swings or trampoline or if they are in deep water swimming, he growls and barks fiercely and is frightening to the kids and the adults. Any suggestions? So it sounds like the puppy doesn't understand what's going on. So we have swings, which to a dog might not make sense. We have a trampoline, which doesn't make sense. And we have deep water, which might not make sense. And what I mean by making sense is dogs learn what is normal and, and what do they see in the world? What can they do? What, what's normal? So the first thing I would do is try having the dog farther back from any of those triggers. And, and the trigger in that would be the swings, the trampoline, or the water, the thing your dog is upset about. What happens if you have him farther back and he can watch from a distance? And that might help him realize that's actually normal and you're going to see that a lot. Um, if, you, if you see that, especially in your backyard, if it's a problem with a swing and a trampoline in your backyard, what I would do is if you've tried having him farther back from those triggers and you've tried giving him, giving him space and he's still upset, I would just I would not have him in the yard when that's happening because the, the barking could be, I'm fearful and I'm not sure. The growling, I, I don't know enough to say exactly what's going on there, so I'd have to say err on the side of caution and just remove him from the environment. Um, and if the deep water is a pool, um, same thing. All right. If you're not using a crate, should you still limit the dog in the house? And if so, what is the best room to do so? Okay, so I'm going to make a couple assumptions. Limit the dog in the house. Is that so you can leave the house? Um, if that's the case, it would depend on the, the age of the dog. So if it's anybody under a year, I would absolutely work on crate training. A dog under a year really can't be trusted to make a good decision when left alone. And by that, I mean that pillow could be fun to eat or those shoes could be fun to have a gnaw on. Or I've always wanted to see what, you know, that uh, stuffed animal tastes like that I just ate and swallowed. So anything under a year, I would absolutely work on crate training. If it's older than a year or you're just not interested in crate training, then I would try something like a mud room um, or a laundry room, as long as there was nothing like socks or clothing or shoes that the dog could get into while you're gone. And I would also do a camera. Um, the room you choose doesn't really, there's not a huge difference in what room it is. You can do a powder room as easily as you can do a laundry room. Um, some dogs do better when they're left behind a gate as opposed to behind a closed door. But I would do a camera because you're not going to want to try one of these rooms and come home and find out, oh, he scratched the heck out of the door or broke out of the door. 
um, if you have a camera and you have some time and patience to work on you know, monitoring his response when you do it, that's the way I would approach it. Okay. Um, so one, we clearly just want to emphasize crates are good. Um, they can <laughs> yes. be a very good friend. Yes. Um, but even if you're leaving them behind some of that, be aware that they still can chew at everything. Um, yes. So don't expect, even if you're putting them in a small room, that they will not, um, especially if they have se separation anxiety, start oh, yeah. chewing on things and destroying things. So crate, crate, crate are, is going to be your best friend, particularly with separation anxiety. It's a huge help. It's not, not a punishment. I think there's a bad stigma around crates, and there shouldn't ever be because um, they are a great tool for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, hashtag crates are cool was posted. That's great. <laughs> um, Deb, I really appreciate you coming. Um, I know that there's even more questions coming in, which is awesome. I kind of wasn't expecting all that, but I'm all right. We have one more. This will be the final one. And then we're calling it break for the night. What do I do if I, my dog has anxiety getting groomed? Mm, okay, I'm going to say with anxiety, I'm going to make an assumption. Well, if you're talking about the dog has never been groomed and they've tried and the dog failed and it was a really horrible experience, groom the, groom the dog at home as best you can. And then I would go talk to the groomer about doing just quick pop-in visits. So the dog goes to the groomer, the groomer gives them some treats and you leave and work up that positive experience, the, the positive emotional response to going to the groomer. If you're talking about the dog doesn't like to be handled, you want to work with that at home first. Make sure you can touch the dog anywhere you need to talk, anywhere you need to touch the dog. Um, and then I would ask the groomer for specific examples of areas where the dog does not like to be touched and see if you can work on it. Um, some groomers will have the owner stay while they work on the dog. Sometimes the dog's a little bit better. Um, without knowing exactly what the anxiety is, that, that's where I would start with it. Um, and, and by the way, all of you pandemic puppy parents, if you have a dog, that's anything other than like, you know, a really, really short haired, like a little pity mix, that's never going to need to see a groomer, even him start brushing your dog from the day you get them just gentle, gentle brushing, gentle handling, get them used to it from the, from the get go. If at any time they're a little bit unsure, reluctant, offer them a little bit of their food while you're doing it. Make that, that positive association between people touch me and I get food. Okay. If you're saying the dog is biting the groomer or really struggling, or you feel it, unqualified to, to work on the handling, that is a great thing to take to a trainer. There's a lot of things trainers can do in terms of changing the emotional response to touch, even teaching the dog stationing behaviors. I work with my clients to teach a chin rest where you put out your hand and the dog rests their chin in it. It's a great way to have a dog get his um, uh, hair around his face trimmed if he'll, if he'll offer that behavior and be part of the, of the behavior, um, part of the uh, the grooming. If you go to fearfreepets.com, that's where I have one of my certifications through. They have videos and training materials for how to get your dog ready for a vet visit, get your dog ready for a grooming visit, things you can work on, things you can do. That chin rest is absolutely on their website as well. Uh, but definitely the, the way to, to really cover the ground is change the association from being going to the groomer is scary or painful to going to the groomer makes awesome happen. Um, so again, uh, so we're, our last question, which kind of leads me into my next point is when's the next live event? Um, so this will be going on every Monday, 730, same time. And I appreciate all of you guys hanging in there with these <laughs> technical difficulties. Um, so thank you very much for that. But uh, we do have one every Monday. It will be announced tomorrow um, and started to be posted. But we have, again, um, a specialist, an expert in the industry on CBD. Um, so they're going to be talking about CBD and pets. We have um, other holistic approaches. We also have um, Christine Egbert, who from Bark Use, talking on puppies. Um, we have different types of enrichment. We have Sarah Weber coming from Furry Elite um, and Sarah Davidson, Conquered Pets. Um, 
Amy Beth Clark, Animal Reiki. So we've got a lot of stuff going on. So please join us um, next week. And I promise we'll get these issues figured out. <laughs> Deb, thank you so much for spending your time um, doing this with us. That's awesome. Great. Thanks for and, having me. Yeah, Pepper's Paws. Uh, and thank you guys all again for hanging in there with us. Have a great night. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. And like and share us and tag someone in us. <laughs>